The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus said, Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Good morning. Years ago, I had a colleague when I was uh, an associate rector in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. He was up the uh, island in Portsmouth. He had one of the coolest pieces of, of rector tchotchke I've ever seen. Now, if you've been in my office, you know that on my desk and on my side table, there are little bits and bobs from all the churches I've served. There's a, L- a Lakota medicine wheel. There's a, a thinking Jesus from the Holy Land. Um, there's even a little bobbing uh, dashboard Jesus that I have that sits behind me when I take a Zoom call on my bookcase. There's lots of little things, but he had the coolest piece. It was a full suit of armor. Like, I mean, it wasn't like a historic one. Like you go to the Met or something like that and you see a 14th century plate armor. No, this was the kind you got at like, you know, a a novelty store. I mean, it was made out of metal, but it was more like uh, aluminum, you know, but it looked like, looked good. And on this suit of armor that was about life size, He had like the helmet of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the sandals of peace. You know, he had all that on little post-it notes that were hung like little little badges. So, and he says, this is great for Sunday school and for adult ed, because when you try to explain to people what these things were and what they kind of look like, you know, this is a good simulation of that. I think he just liked having a suit of armor in his office. But this is one of the great things about that particular passage to understand that we can get confused by the intense symbology that is used in scripture sometimes and we can get distracted by it and i think of all of those particular stories and and testimonies that we hear in the new testament and aside from all of the bread discourse that we've been engaging in this of this summer of course when we're all trying to lose weight and have our beach bodies we're getting lessons about carbs But in this moment, we're hearing about armor. Armor is military, militant. It it, it talks about and speaks to us of of violence. You know, we were talking about it at the Wednesday Bible study with my uh, fellow preachers. And one of the things that I, I shared was I still remember vividly getting a Sunday school coloring sheet that showed David dressed in his big brother's armor looking absolutely ridiculous. You know, the, the oversized helmet, the, the, uh, the breastplate that strapped on went down past his knees, you know, a sword he couldn't lift, a shield that was bigger than he was, and he, if he tried to pick it up, he'd tip over. So he says, no, I'll just have a sling, and I'll do that thing. It, setting aside all of the martial arts issues of that for just a second, because I could discourse on that for a while, but I won't, because there's lemonade out there. But in any event, It isn't about arms and the military that we're talking. 
I want you to, when you are going home with this lesson in hand, and I hope you do take it home, I want you to read it again and understand that for every one of those hard images of military strength that Paul is talking about, he contrasts that profoundly and intensely. He challenges it with images of a testimony of faith that tie profoundly and directly, not into something that is about violence, but something that is about reconciliation and peace. He reframes every single martial image into one that is about hope and peace and reconciliation in the light of the gospel. Sandals that allow you to proclaim the gospel of peace. A helmet that is nothing more than the truth. A breastplate that is nothing more than simple righteousness. Understand that he is challenging us to set down the things that we use to not only defend ourselves, but also to attack the other and to transform them into things that reconcile and bring a sense of awareness of connection to the other. When so often a full set of armor does the very opposite. In attempting to prevent us from going, coming to harm, it cuts us off. It cuts us off from feeling touch, from experiencing connection in favor of defense and offense. It's not easy sometimes to absorb those teachings when we are supposed to be able to defend ourselves and take care of ourselves, that the very thing we're being asked to do is to render ourselves vulnerable and open to a gospel that is cracking us open all the time to be available to the other rather than protected from the other. And to be open to a set of relationships and interactions that are transformative for us and cause us to be aware that we are being changed by God rather than to be confirmed in our suppositions, our certainties, and our prejudices. It carries us beyond that. That's the very core of Jesus' hard teaching when he talks about the reconciling power of the bread and the blood, the body and the blood that he offers, the bread and the wine that he prefers. He is telling us that when you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will not be the same. You will be transformed. You will become more me than you. You will become the gospel rather than simply being proponents of it. And this is a hard teaching. And many depart from the way. And for once in his blurting life, our patron Peter actually manages the correct response. You did take note of that at the end of the gospel, didn't you? When Peter's the one who raises his hand and says, Lord, you know, we've kind of become convinced that you actually possess the words of life and hope. I, I, I think we're with you. I think we're in this to hang out for a while. Now, I hope you both find that comforting and slightly not reassuring, because what it does is it carries us into a rather difficult space where we are being asked to proclaim a gospel that takes us beyond most of our assumed defenses in this life. We talk here at St. Peter's about being a place of welcome, of being an open and affirming parish, and that's awesome. And the rhetoric really feels good to speak. And I was having a conversation last week with someone who says, you know, I found in this place one of the most welcoming spaces I've ever encountered in my life. I was deeply moved by that. But at the same time, I lay it before you, if you found an open and welcoming church here, that's great. But now it's on you to continue to propagate that experience and share it with others. See where it happens there? Just the minute we get comfortable with God, the minute we experience healing and reconciliation, God says, great, now get out. Go out. Share that. Take with you the things you need from here, but know that this is not the place to dwell. It is the place to begin a journey that is going to then transform you and send you out into a world that is yearning for the good news of God. I'm, I'm consumed as well with the thought of Solomon in the temple in this moment when he's consecrating it. And people are amazed and overcome with the emotion of finally having a worship space that they can enter into and meet God face to face, even though that is a very powerful and frightening thing. 
I mean, the smoke and the incense of the presence of God is so thick that not even the priest can get close enough to the altar to celebrate the mysteries. That's a lot of incense. And in that context, at the very moment when everyone should be resting on their laurels, patting themselves on the back and saying, job well done, we did it. That's the very moment when Solomon says, and when a stranger comes into our midst, let them find the welcome that we have found with you, God. The minute we are at peace, we are provoked to grace. That is the lesson of the bread and the wine. That is the lesson of the Lord's Supper, supper broken, blessed, and shared. But it is also the reality that the very moment we take our blessing from God, both in this liturgy and in this life, is the very moment we move from blessing to dismissal. And we are commissioned to go out from this space and proclaim not only the good news of God in Christ, but also to recognize that this church is not bound by four walls or a door or a roof, but instead it is open to a world that is seeking transformation. And we are the catalyst by the grace of the gospel, by the sandals of peace, by the belt of truth, by the breastplate of righteousness, by the helmet of faith. We go forth with the full armor of God, vulnerable and open to the wonders of a peace of God that passes all understanding and a blessing that will flow through us and nourish the world with hope and justice so that the light of Christ may shine everywhere and not just here. Amen. My siblings in Christ, I invite you to...